to the cloud. Here we are in week eight of R795. 795. That means after tonight, we're more than halfway through this class. And in a month and a week, not even, you'll be turning in your final projects in the middle of November, believe it or not. I don't want to stress anyone out, but the whole faculty met and talked about what students should be doing in turn to this class as a final project. Should you have the whole proposal done or be on the way to getting a proposal done? And I suggested being on the way to getting a proposal done. Otherwise, people will stress out about quals and having a proposal done at the end of this class. And I didn't want to overstress people. So I was in your corner today, just so you know. Uh, and I think pretty much everyone agreed. But also at that meeting, Professor Bowling and others presented a template that people could follow when they're going to do um, an EDD. So we would have a skeleton or a guideline or a template of things that you will include in your doctorate uh, proposal so that you at least have some confidence and have some substance uh, within your proposal, knowing that you followed some guidelines, anyhow, the department recognizes. We don't want to prescribe or pre-prescribe anything for you in this, uh, in terms of your proposals, but we do know that it's a very stressful time. And to, if you could provide at least some categories of things like problem statement, purpose, significance, background literature, framework, research questions, methodology design, data sources, and then a couple other things about references and analytical strategies and things like that. So, you know, if if you all, if someone reminds me, I'll, I'll see if I can find Professor Bowling's email to me and see, I could send this to you if you're interested in getting that. I'll also say that I'm halfway through grading in this class and at about 2 a.m. I got asked to look at some other project. So I was working on that until 3.30 this morning and four o'clock almost. And then when I woke up today, I found out I missed a dissertation offense. So this is the first time in my life I've ever missed a dissertation offense. And I had read it. I had sent my comments to the author a month ago. Uh, I scanned the whole thing in. I was ready to go. But actually, I missed. So the, 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 the lesson for all of you, the day before you defend, send an email to everybody on your committee reminding them of the defense. I had it in my planner for next week, Tuesday. We, I didn't get any reminder, at least I don't remember getting a reminder, but I actually remember setting up in everyone's Outlook calendar. So it was in my Outlook calendar. I just never checked my Outlook calendar. I don't like Outlook calendars monitoring what I do. I like to be a free human being. And so I go with a paper planner. So for the sake of your faculty members who might be old school and have a paper planner, send them an email reminder the day before and the day before that and the day before that. Um, at least one email rem reminder, because this happens <laughs> to people like me and it'll happen to you if you don't do that. So I will say you've done fairly well in your third assignments. I have half of yours still to read, so I won't. I didn't send those back yet. Um, we had a department meeting this afternoon, which caused some delay. I thought I'd finish them this afternoon, get them all back to you before class time, but I'll definitely get them done tonight and scan them and send them back to you tonight. Your next assignment, part four, will be due October 25th. I will be at ACT, therefore there'll be four day and we could probably even say five or six day extension on that if you want like, because I will be back from AECT on the 29th of October and I will not read them during AECT. So don't stress out on the next part, take as much time as you want. Some of you have done qualifying exam practice. Aishad in particular, as I told Aishad, she did extremely well in these. I'll read these a little more thoroughly tonight, Aishad. If anyone else did quals and they're in my Canvas account, please, 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 I said please three times. I've also got a free book now, I free, free, free. Um, so there, the, there's a follow-up to my Tech Variety book that came out that's uh, you can, you, for motivating and retaining students online and a free class. But in terms of quals, if you've done these and they're in my Canvas account, I am not gonna check Canvas for a few days because I'm grading papers as, and avoiding Canvas. So please, please send me an email with the Word document or PDF of the, of the uh, 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 
Oh, I'm hearing a fiber I hear myself. Um, okay, uh, thanks for uh, signing in, Ben. So um, <laughs> if you've got it in Word or PDF, send an email to me and then I'll print it and, and read them. I will not be looking at Canvas anymore. I've printed everything out, all the grading. So just as a, a little help for me, I got my other class to grade, two assignments in this class to grade, and I just want to avoid going into Canvas. So please send me an email with the practice if you've done them. Okay, that's the announcements for today. We have a special guest tonight, Florence Martin, who's done two special issues with me during the past two years. The second one just went to the printer, to the copy editor, all nine journal articles in the online learning journal. It'll be out in March. The only thing missing is our intro piece that, we're, that the two of us, plus Vanessa Denon at Florida State, are working on. So Vanessa, Florence, and I have done one special issue for ETRD on system, systemic reviews, systematic reviews of the research on emerging learning technologies and learning environments, which was a very successful issue and has many mm, positive feedbacks that we've gotten in many citations. It was a little bit more a little bit longer than this one. We had 13 main pieces, plus an intro, an ending, and a preface. We had 16 pieces in that one. Uh, in this one, we have nine uh, accepted out of maybe, what do we have, 30 initially proposed? Florence, what do we have? 20, no, 22? It was was more, that 22 was the invited in the first it, round. Yeah, that was invited. I think we had yeah. a lot more than that. We rejected half right. of them. Oh, yeah, 44. I think 44. we had 44. So out of 44 papers su submitted as proposals, we only accepted nine in the end. But it's still pretty good. It's like a quarter or 20% or so, 20, 25. That's a good odd. So if there's a special issue, I always recommend if you've got data, try, try it because it's usually more streamlined and it gets published a little quicker and you get to know people. It's more of a community feel to it, but it is as rigorous as the as a traditional way. So Florence and I have done these two and we've we've known each other for many years. And she is one of the leaders within the field of instructional technology. I would say one of the young leaders in the field of instructional technology. And the field needs that because for decades it's been led by the elder statesmen and stateswomen of the field who are now starting to, or have during the past decade retired. And we need people like, like Florence Martin and others. If you go to AECT, you will see many others like Rick West is another one. Uh, but you know, I could go on and on. Uh, Albert Ritzhoff, who Florence works with heavily at Fl University of Florida, who's presented in this class. Um, so there are some leaders starting to, to percolate up. Florence presented a year ago to my R795 class on what, how to do a systematic review of the research. And, and the articles are also about meta-analyses. So maybe Florence can talk a little bit about the difference between meta-analyses and systematic review of the research. Florence got her degree at Arizona State, and we still like her. Uh, no, she didn't go to Indiana. She went to the, one of the other really good schools, Arizona State. And then she went off to UNC Charlotte, University of North Carolina Charlotte, or Wilmington first, where she was a star. And in, in she moved over to Charlotte, where many IU faculty or many alums have moved uh, to Charlotte or have been at Charlotte. Uh, we had Michael Thomas in this class a couple of weeks ago. He worked at Charlotte for a bit. Um, and um, many successful East Carolina University, UNC Charlotte, Texas Tech, University of Houston, Stanford Business School, Purdue are hotbeds of IU alums. <laughs> um, they have a lot of alums at those respective places. You wouldn't think of Stanford Business School, but yeah, um, those aren't faculty positions there. Those are um, staff um, in, in development. But she moved now to NC State. So only a couple months ago, she made a transition to, she was a full professor, I think, at UNC Charlotte. She moved as a full professor to NC State. Um, and they just, they just saw that her talents and, and said, we need that, we need her here. Uh, even though there wasn't a position actually posted that we saw, they knew that, that, uh, yeah. that she would be the right person, that Florence would fill a gap that they needed at NC State. So, and, also at that time, she had a proposal for a book on systematic reviews of the research. And I recommended my friends at Rutledge and my friends, well, sort of my friends at SAGE. SAGE is the better of the two in terms of statistics books, 
inquiry books, um, methodology books. They're well known for that. And so um, Florence had uh, offers from both and she went with Sage and she'll tell us about that at the end of her presentation about uh, book proposal um, process because you all might benefit from those insights and wisdom that she has. Um, so I will let Florence take over at this point, originally born in India, by the way, and immigrated to the United States. I don't know, maybe in 2001, maybe, or 2002, when, when was it? Um, 2001. Hey, that's that's big, right. 21 years she's been in the USA. Florence, you want to fill in any gaps about your career, um, your journey in this and, and all that? Well, yeah, I think that was a great introduction. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, can I go ahead and share my um, screen? You definitely can. Um, I'm assuming you all can see the slides. And I have a little bit of introduction, just a few more specifics, so we'll talk through it. So thank you uh, to Dr. Bong to, for inviting me to come talk to you all today. Um, so again, my name is Florence Martin. I'm a professor of learning design and technology. That's what the program here at NC State is called. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's learning, comma, design, no comma, I and technology. Oh, actually, yeah, you know, the second comma, yeah, you can put the comma. Some places they have a comma, some places they don't have a comma. So. They don't have any commas at Stanford. I think it's just learning, I know, design, I like and technology. The commas, so I like commas there. The commas. Yeah. yeah. So I titled today's talk a systematic review of research in online teaching and learning. Uh, so that's what I'm going to be presenting to you all today. Uh, I'm passionate about two things when it comes to research. One is research in the area of online teaching and learning. So if you are interested in online teaching and learning, there is a possibility you might have seen some of my work. Um, the other thing that I'm very passionate about is doing systematic reviews, which is a methodology, right? So systematic reviews are a secondary research methodology. And so when both of these come together, when you do systematic reviews and online teaching and learning, I'm like doubly excited. So that's what we're we going to talk about today. And that's my website. If you want to pull up and, you know, uh, read a little bit more about me, I do keep it updated. Um, I just transitioned to NC State. So I've been in the UNC system uh, for 15 years. This is my 16th year in academia. Um, and I, I I brought in, I did a new website, they use WordPress, and so you can still find all my pubs if you want to go look at it. If you don't have access, send me an email, and I can uh, email it to you. So quickly, what do I do? What does a faculty do, right? I teach two, two courses uh, in any given semester in LDT. Uh, I went in brand new, but I'm the program coordinator for the doctoral concentration. Uh, actually, it's uh, not in educational leadership. I should say teacher education and learning sciences. Ed leadership was my prior one. It's still an LDT doc concentration. Um, I'm on three NSF grants. I'm the PI on two grants on digital safety and uh, NSF grant and one on educational technology security. I'm still waiting for those two grants to transfer. I'm a co-PI on a third one, which is on preparing high school teachers to teach programming online. So big picture, I enjoy working on cybersecurity and uh, CSED related work. Um, and then I serve as an, a senior associate editor for OLJ. I just got promoted. Uh, I just heard about that. Uh, and then I'm doing the special issue. Oh, with, uh, congrats. Dr. Big clap there. OLJ is online learning journal. It's open access yeah. and will soon be SSCI, social science citation. Right. I'm, my guess is. That it's it's yeah. really moved up in the rankings. Right. Um, and then we're doing the special issue that Dr. Bonk mentioned, right? With Dr. Bonk and Dr. Denon. Uh, we're doing that one on systematic reviews. I also serve as an associate editor for educational research review. So, um, so again, you know, you see two of my passions. I'm interested in online learning and then educational research review publishes only meta-analysis and systematic reviews. If you've heard about RER, so this is the European equivalent and they have an impact factor of 11 point something. So that high it is, you know? So the impact is really high. And then um, I serve as an advisory council member for NCBPS, which is North Carolina Virtual Public Schools. And I also uh, did the section chair conference planning this year, or I'm still doing, uh, for AERA Division C uh, Section 1E, which is engineering and computer science. Uh, and then I do a ton of service. So that's how I keep myself busy. So these are just a few things. Um, so I told you about me. I would like to know about you. So let's start with text chat one. 
So tell me what program you are in, what year you are in. Yeah, let's do the text chat uh, one first. And then if you want to combine it, you can also tell me, like if you work full-time, you can tell me where you work. If you work part-time, you can tell me what you do. If you're a full-time student and you don't work at all, you can tell me that as well, just to get to know you guys. And it's a small group actually, so. You can probably throw in special hobbies or if you'd rather be watching the baseball game tonight, that's okay. Just, you know, if you're a baseball nut or whatever, she, you know, just give us some something about you. And I'll, while you're typing in, I'll mention that RER stands for Review of Educational Research, which is the top journal of the American Education Research Association. It's kind of one of the flagship journal, uh, journals. They have a couple of them. The American Education Research Journal being the other, that AERJ being more statistics-based, more data-based, whereas Review of Ed Research is a review of the research, like a systematic review, summarizing what the research says and meta-analyses and so forth. In my doctoral work, I had an article sent to Review of Ed Research, and I was basically about an hour revision away from acceptance, and I gave up. <laughs> it's my one, my, one of my qualifying exams could have been published in Review of Ed Research, and I just didn't have the notion of persistence, which I have now. Uh, persistence wins the day. Perseverance wins the day in education research. Okay. So there you've got some ants, some people coming okay, in. Okay, yeah, Kim responded, uh, the final semester of coursework. Okay, and Megan says, okay, a lot of final semester of, of classes. Mathematics and adjunct, okay. These are senior people. Oh, nice. So you are, you went to school here. Megan said she got her MA in math, mathematics education at UNCC. Oh. Yeah. Small world. Yep. Shannon, again, last course calls next month. Okay. Instructional design manager. Okay. Mm -hmm. Family medicine, department of family medicine at the school of medicine. Okay. Nice. Okay. The others keep typing. Um, just for me to know who's in the audience, right? It helps me get an understanding. Okay. Okay. Megan says she's moved to Philadelphia, but lived in MC for 15 years. Okay. And, and Aisha, okay. A lot of, again, first semester, final semester of coursework, high school teacher, coach science Olympiad, drone club, and gems club. Okay. Interested in cybersecurity. Wonderful. Sunmi. Okay, working on my dissertation, mobile application developer at Stanford University. Okay, so you do have a lot of students who are in different states. Yep, yep. They're... Okay. So, sometimes I get a lot of Indianapolis people in this. We have a lot of Indianapolis people in our doctoral program at EDD, but this, this, this course has... You know, from all over all over yeah. yeah and then kim says she's an associate professor of dairy cattle management and animal science at suny cobble skill okay upstate new york yeah i just found out that nc state has a big um agricultural sciences college you're known for it too uh okay looking into launching an online program Okay, wonderful. Okay, so thank you for those of you who took the time to introduce Yuma. Okay. Yeah, I, I will also point out that Florence is an expert at online instructor skills and competencies and quality online programs. So Kim, if you have questions, follow-ups, you might want to send up as you develop your program, Florence is an expert on what to look for in those programs and in how to train instructors and what skills and competencies that they do need. Okay, thank you, Kurt. Okay, so if you look at this visual here, right, um, what we're going to do is I'm going to talk mostly about this um, green circle in the in between green circle, you know, the, the small one is also in green. So you have all reviews, you know, which is the big picture, secondary research, all kinds of uh, reviews can happen. Then you have systematic reviews and then meta-analysis, which is a systematic review, but it's a subset, right? Uh, a very specialized uh, quantitative uh, focused review, which is a meta-analysis. Another wish, okay, here's the definition. Uh, and this is one that we came up with when we wrote our um, ETR in the editorial. And this is how we defined it. Systematic reviews aim to examine secondary data by reviewing, synthesizing, and assessing existing knowledge in a subject in a logical, transparent, and analytical manner. So you retrieve, you synthesize, and you assess, 
Okay, three important elements. Um, it follows a specific methodology. Again, you can locate, select, evaluate, analyze, synthesize, and report. That's another way to you know, define it. Um, that was a definition by Denier and Tranfield. So what is clear here is you, know, you have all this existing research. So as a systematic review researcher, you go in, you try to make sense of it, you collect it, and then you try to analyze it to understand the big picture. So for me, I love big picture studies. Right. I, I like to know what is being done, where are the gaps, because I think that's also important to do to move the field forward. Personal thought, I think every doc student should do a systematic review to start their dissertation, because then they have all the literature regarding their topic. When you do a literature review, just a literature review, you're very selective. You know, you might try your best to bring in all um, pieces, but then it's still very, um, you know, it's your perspective, right? You can report only the, the findings that you want to report. So that's, you know, one of the differences between just doing a literature review versus a systematic review. So before we get into systematic review, so this is one Dr. Bonk already mentioned. This was the etr &D article. If you're looking for some good systematic reviews to read, this one focused on emerging learning environments and technology. So we had topics on social media, MOOCs, special ed technology, mobile learning, game-based learning and gamification, adaptive learning, learning analytics. Especially if any of you have research interests on these topics, definitely take the time to go look. So this was in 2020, okay? So it's been a couple of years now. Uh, and we also have a, a good editorial which sets the stage for all, all of these uh, studies. And then the new one, oh, this should say 2023. Sorry, I meant to say 2023. This is not published yet. This is the one Dr. Bonk mentioned. We just accepted these articles today. Um, and uh, these are the nine topics. I put in the nine topics. Um, there was trends during COVID, features of high quality online learning, role of moderators in asynchronous online discussion, underrepresented and minoritized learners, help seeking strategies, online learner collaboration, passive participation, intersubjectivity, and assessment, all within the context of online learning. So now, you know, we try to really zoom in and within the context of online learning, we picked out a number of topics. So I think uh, it's going to benefit the community a lot. Um, so we are hoping this will be published in 2023. So that should have, that should say 2023. So I'll point out that this is hot off the press. She just did this just for us. So I'm very appreciative of Florence doing that. Uh, and, and we are in the midst, in the throes of this project. So I, again, appreciate Florence uh, adding all this to it. Uh, I had requested it late this afternoon. So this is how quick she works. Uh, and, and I'll also point out she won many awards last year at ACT and she's going to win another one this year. So, um, so we're hearing from a star and we have a star in this class as well. Ashot got an article printed, accepted for Tech Trends today. Congrats to Ashot and we should give her a round of applause too. Uh, it is Drone Club, Exploring Engineering and Employability Skills Outside the Classroom. So congrats to Florence, congrats to Ashot and everyone else. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you. That's Asia. Okay. So <clears throat> here's a taxonomy that I want to show you before, you know, we go into zoom in into a systematic review. Um, so uh, we heard Dr. Bonk mentioned request. Uh, so Dr. West and I wrote this piece. Uh, it's under review. It's not published yet. We haven't even gotten feedback yet. Um, so he does work more on the right side on like, you know, conceptual papers, theoretical framework. He actually led a special issue on theoretical frameworks. And I am more on the other side, other extreme meta-analysis and systematic reviews. So he emailed me once and said, why don't we write something together? So that's what we did. So he focuses more on the advocacy argument. I focus more on the summary argument. So we, and we look through how do we categorize these. So in the end, we identified, put these into seven big buckets. So theoretical framework, wherever there is, you know, um, an emphasis on theory development, 
Um, so that falls there. And then literature synthesis, which most of you are used to doing, right? You're just synthesizing existing literature. Uh, and then conceptual papers, again, you're developing some kind of uh, advancing, you know, a conceptual framework uh, development that falls there. Integrated or mixed, we put it in between because integrated or mixed method reviews, what they do is they use both empirical um, papers as well as theoretical papers, and then they try to put them together. So that's why that's in between. And then you see some researchers do bibliometric and citation analysis, where they extract, you know, the reference list and look through it and uh, or look at citations and uh, make sense of that. So that falls there. And then comes the systematic reviews. The way I do systematic reviews is I focus more on empirical data, but I look at both quantitative and qualitative studies together. Um, again, other researchers could interpret this differently too. Um, but I focus on empirical data. Again, you know, you, you synthesize and you assess and, you know, you make sense of the findings. Then meta-analysis, which I already introduced to you, is a subset of systematic review because here you're looking only at the quantitative uh, studies and especially quantitative studies that focus on similar outcomes because, you know, to put them all together and to identify or calculate a summer summary effect, they all have to be studying a same outcome, right? Same variable or similar variable studying the same outcome. So that's a meta-analysis. So this is, I, I really like this visual. And, uh, and we were talking when uh, Dr. West and I were talking, we said, this is a great visual to introduce to a new doc student right, for them to see how everything lays out. So literature synthesis is not the only way to synthesize literature, right? So you have so many other ways you could do it. Um, here's a quick look. Again, this is a lot in it. Again, you can go to my website, florencemartin.net, and pull up these. So I just highlighted five here. I've done about 10 systematic reviews. I just counted before I came to class today. I've done 10 systematic reviews and at least uh, three meta-analysis. Um, so out of the 10, these five um, uh, I just brought in. So I've done on topics on synchronous online learning, adaptive learning, online teaching and learning, K-12 online teaching and learning. And the last one that was just accepted uh, recently is online learner satisfaction. So the one I'm going to talk to you over today, today, the one I'm going to talk to you about is on the online teaching and learning, which was published in Computers in Education in 2020. So it's a couple of years old, but I think it's still a simple and a good one. And so, you know, we're going to spend time on it. So you can see how, you know, they are all kind of similar topics, but um, it's still very very meaningful and uh, for someone who's beginning to research in that area, reading a systematic review gives you a really nice big picture. So we're going to spend the next few minutes, uh, you know, talking through this particular one, right? Um, uh, the one that was published in Computers and Ed. Uh, and I just looked, so this is published, we did this right before COVID. And it went under review during COVID. And I just looked again before class today, and it had 220 citations in two years. So that shows, you know, the impact a systematic review can have. Systematic reviews are usually well cited uh, because, you know, it's again a big picture study, right? So a lot of people can use it uh, in, in their literature review. So the way I do a systematic review, anytime I start a systematic review, I like to go see what are the reviews exist, right? You don't want to do one if someone had done one last year on the same topic. Right. Again, you might be take, are answering different questions, but you don't want it to be exactly the same. So in this case, um, I found three reviews um, that were kind of related. Uh, but if you look at 1990 to 1999, there was one. Uh, and then 1993 to 1994, which kind of overlapped a little in terms of years. And then finally, there's a 2000 and 2008. So the one, the third column can be said, you know, they probably had more online learning, but the first two had a lot more of distance education in there too. You know, we didn't start seeing a whole lot of online learning studies you know, post 2000s or late 90s, right? So we saw a lot more DE studies, like video conferencing was heavily used 
at that point in the 80s and 90s. So those were more DE focused articles, but they still had some online learning in there too. So I kept all of them and I went and looked. So what, what themes did they see? I'm not going to go through all of them in detail. I'll bring this back again in discussion when we talk about it. So I, I, I went in and saw what did they find, you know, and then what was least researched on. So um, that's kind of, that's my only thing I have for your literature review. And then what we did is um, I always develop a code book, you know, this is not a final version of a code book that you're going to end up with, but you start a code book. Um, and then as you are like, you know, you go with a priori codes, but then as you're coding, it's going to tweak, get tweaked and, you know, modified from what you're seeing in, in, in the coding process, right? So these were the themes we went with. Um, so, I mean, this is the final themes actually. So it's like, these were the categories and, you know, uh, similar things we went with. We had some items at the learner level, at the course and instructor level, and some at the organization level. So when you think about online teaching and learning, right? Different levels, and then we had multiple themes and different levels. So I have a question for you now. So looking at this, which research theme do you think is most studied? Again, based on the study, this was in 2020. You can type it for me in the chat. Just take a guess. And let me ask the follow-up question after you give the answer. Okay, I'm not gonna give the answer yet. Okay. So this has 12, okay, 12 themes. Among these 12 themes, what do you think was the most studied? Uh, along with the level, give me the name of the theme. So pick from the bulleted list, just not the level. Pick one among the 12. Okay, Aisha says design, Shannon says engagement, Yuma says course technologies, okay. Going to give you a few more seconds. It's always interesting to, like, you know, take a guess. Facilitation. Okay. 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 So I'm going to move on for the sake of time. Um, what do you think was least studied? least study, yeah, and pick one. Okay, Megan says organizational themes, okay, policy and management, okay. Okay, did you guys download the article already? <laughs> uh, they're pretty close. Okay, uh, guesses are right. Okay, so go ahead, Kurt. You wanted to add something. Knowing this class, soon we already downloaded and gave it sent to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, of those three macro headings organization, course, and instructor, and learner do you think which of those had the largest increase during COVID? One, two, or three? And then which of those had the second most increase during COVID, one, two, or three? Which had the most increase and which had just, you know, which had the second most increase? According to my article in the upcoming 2023 special issue. <laughs> Yeah, so Dr. Bong's article used this framework to start with, and then they analyzed studies just during COVID. Yeah. So they clearly saw the increase during COVID. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So why don't you give your answer? Then I'm going to give you the answer, answer during yeah. the presentation. I'm not going to. Yeah. Okay, it. we'll wait. Yeah, okay. yeah, just a few more uh, minutes. We're all, yeah. all, all, almost there. Okay. Yeah. So our goal was to examine publication trends 
right, in the 10 years. So as I said, you know, we've been wrapped it up in 18. We spent time on this in 19. Uh, we sent it out for review towards the end of 19. You know, it can take anywhere from six months to a year, depending upon your data set, how many articles you have and how large of a team you have, how many people are working full time and, you know, things like that. So, and then we wanted to compare it with the previous team. So we had wrote three questions. So first one was just what population percentage of the population of articles published in the journals were related to online learning and empirical, and then frequency of online learning research themes. And we also wrote a question on methods and settings. What methods and settings, you know, were, were these research published in? Um, we used, you know, there's a number of frameworks that can guide your systematic review. We just used the one from uh, IES, what, what works clearinghouse with the five uh, levels. Uh, you know, you develop your protocol, identify the literature, then screen the studies, review the studies, and then your report findings. So this is a little bit more broader. So that's what we did. Um, so data sources, we just used one database, which is Education Research Complete. Um, you know, you could have gone so many directions, but even that we had so many hits uh, and we had to like narrow it down in terms of scope. So, um, you know, it had several journals indexed in it. So we just used that. Uh, and then we just used five search terms. Again, we could have gone a lot more broader, uh, but like, you know, we didn't use online support in here. And so occasionally I get emails. Why was my article not in there? <laughs> so, you know, so it depends on the search terms you use, <laughs> right? So you have to be ready to like, ready to justify your choice of search terms and uh, data sources. That's what matters. Um, we use this process flow on the left. I would recommend to use the one on the right. OK, um, so the one on the left is just very high level. So initial search, we had 3,332 articles. That's a lot, right? So what we did is to narrow it down, we just um, looked at 12 journals. 12 journals and that ended up with 753 articles and then out of that we reviewed every one of them at the abstract level and we ended up with 619 articles so that's still a lot right because we are looking at online learning research themes right so that's such a broad topic um i would recommend using the one on the right where you can clearly show you know how many duplicates were removed title screening uh, abstract screening and then including it in the synthesis that's why i, I brought that uh, picture in there were three researchers who worked on creating the code book and two researchers coded so it's always helpful to have two people code for irr or interator reliability so that you know there's just not bias one person's perception and you know the entire coding process so the code book included 12 themes that i showed earlier uh, and we also included four research settings higher it, continuing it, K-12, and corporate and military, and then three research methods, quantitative, qualitative, and mixed method. Remember, I said I used only empirical studies, which means other review studies were excluded, other conceptual pieces, theoretical pieces were all excluded, uh, mainly because, uh, you know, I was interested in themes and methods and settings. Um, you can use this number of tools that can be used. We used Max QDA, which is actually a qualitative software, uh, but it was still a fun experience. You know, we brought in uh, all the abstracts. We uh, ex uh, extracted it into an Excel sheet and then brought it in. So every document was uh, an abstract and then we kind of coded. Uh, you could code using a Google form. There are like, if you are doing matters, there are so many new tools now. Um, you know, you, uh, we are you trying one called uh, Kadima. Kadima is one. Covidence is another new one. I saw that uh, AIR has released another new one recently. So there's so many ones, free ones too, that can be used uh, to support you in the process. I personally even like using Google form in the process of coding. Um, so this is what we did. And then data analysis, what we did is, it's very descriptive. You know, the study we created frequency tables. Um, and then for publication trends, we, we drew a, a line graph and then descriptive uh, information for the themes. And we did cross-tab analysis for research settings and methodology. Um, so this is the one, you know, our first question is what percentage of the articles they publish um, focuses on online teaching and learning. 
So you can see uh, frequency of empirical uh, online learning research, 152 articles were published. And uh, so that accounted for 22.5% of journals total articles. So we kind of just to get an idea how, how many articles published in journals, you know, uh, focus on online teaching and learning because you know we also used only um, 100 not 112 journals right so we kind of did this analysis by year you can see how it, there has been an increase right uh, so this chart if Dr. Bong's team creates this this line probably will just go straight <laughs> right COVID we all know that there were so many studies on online learning Right, so this line graph would just like increase. Uh, okay, so for those of you who responded to the themes, I saw engagement in there. So whoever said engagement, engagement was the wi most widely studied theme, followed by learner characteristic. Those were the two, and the least studied. Uh, actually, instructor characteristic had the lowest uh, number of articles, but then those of you who put in organizational uh, themes in there, there's still a need. Definitely, you know, the organizational level, there's not enough studies done. All, all of them, you know, institutional support, access, culture, equity, intuition, ethics, leadership policy, and management. So all of that. I'm going to like pause for a minute. Um, Dr. Bach, would you like to tell us what themes you you your study found during COVID? So uh, yeah, so you know, learners always going to be looked at and explored, of course. And those some studies were going to continue that had been started before pre-COVID. People are interested in learner learner engagement, undoubtedly, but the areas of increase had to do with the instructor side mm. and a bit with diversity, equity, and inclusion issues and this institutional support issues and course design and development issues as opposed to learner engagement, learner characteristics, and learner outcomes. You know, during COVID, it was hard to measure the, you know, the outcomes of any effects. So, you know, so people were more concerned with, you know, ramping up instructors and getting them ready to teach in such environments, having those courses be of high enough quality. So there isn't people, there aren't people calling them into contention and there were monies provided by the states and federal government agencies to, and, and the school districts themselves to, to focus in on the quality and characteristics and the developmental side so uh, the quality assurance areas, it's quality assurance um, aspects of the course, uh, these were the areas that we saw the largest increase. But of course, they're going to de deem to be a large increase because there's such a small percentage previously. So, you know, when you, when you increase from having, you know, uh, 30 studies addressing organizational side to having 40 of them, well, that's a, that's a, huge, that's a 30% increase or whatever, okay? But uh, it, there were probably a number of things related to the learner side that increased too, but we, we were studying such a large uh, number of studies devoted to the learner side. And the same was true of MOOCs. So I've done systematic reviews of the MOOC research and my former advisee, Mena Ju, along with um, Anissa Sari, my current doctoral student, we've studied uh, MOOCs for a number of years and there too, in the old days of MOOCs, and MOOCs have only been around, you know, a dozen or so years, the early days uh, were more focused on the learner side than the instructor side. And recently, the emphasis has been more towards doing more qualitative research. There's much more quantitative computer log data early on, and because that's what people can get. You can download for free the log data. Well, now they want to find out about the nuances of MOOCs. So they interview people, and they look under the hood. They look at the courses, and especially look at instructors. So our much of our studies were on the instructor side. So it's true of MOOCs. It's true of online learning in general across the board. Does that? um resonate uh florence yeah totally totally i, I can really see um uh, why that would have happened okay so um so you know for the for the things when we had a lot of studies we wanted to dig in a little more deeper to see uh, look for some sub themes so on engagement you know we were wondering what were people studying and so we saw presence interaction community participation, collaboration, involvement, communication. So you probably heard of all those terms, right? All these are used to enhance engagement. It's just looked at it through a different lens. 
So we kind of coded that. Um, and I've written a follow-up piece on this online learner engagement, if anybody's interested. It came out in the educational psychologist. They did a special issue on online learning. So we, I wrote a piece with Jared Borup on online engagement. And we also looked at learner characteristics to look at a little bit more uh, uh, closely what learner characteristics were studied. They looked at self-regulation, motivational characteristics, academic characteristics, effective characteristics, cognitive characteristics, and demographic characteristics. We all know that meeting learners' needs is very important, right? So a lot of studies were uh, done to understand, you know, uh, learner characteristics in the online context. Can you um, send me the article on engagement? I'll forward it to the students because that's a critical, critical thing. It's something right. that was very difficult to measure. So if you've looked at and found articles measuring it and calling it something different, right. it's important for people to read that. Yeah. And her colleague, Jira, Jared uh, Borup, is at George Mason University. Um, an up and coming uh, person in the field as well. Yeah, yeah, I'll be glad to send it to you uh, when we are done. Okay, so looking at setting, where were these studies conducted? Mostly in higher ed, you can see the numbers, right? Uh, a few studies in K-12 and continuing ed, not many in corporate or military, or at least they are not published in these journals. Uh, so what we did was we did like a cross-tab analysis, which is a chi-square, right? Just comparing the variables. So just to see, so for example, engagement, you know, uh, 153 articles were in the higher ed, and then to see the split, you know, is there a particular theme that is published more elsewhere? So that's what we kind of looked at. Uh, I don't think we found anything really mind blowing here. Same way we looked at research method. So what type of methodology is used to study these themes? Um, so if you look at it, uh, you know, quantitative was the highest, 324. Qualitative was 200 and mixed method was 95. Um, for example, if you look at engagement, clearly, you know, there was, I mean, there was nine, 78 quantitative studies, 69 qualitative, but look at learner characteristics, a lot more quantitative studies, right? So certain themes, they were more heavily uh, quantitative focused. So that is something uh, that was interesting. Um, and then, you know, qualitative was kind of spread out all through. So this is another type of analysis you could do if you want to compare, uh, you know, methodology to your themes or any other characteristics. And then this is a visual I showed you at the beginning, right? I showed you the first three reviews. So what I did is I added the, my study here or our review here. Um, so on this review, I collaborated with a, a doc student. She was a doc student at that point, Tingson. And then another methodology professor, Carl Westin, uh, both of them at UNC Charlotte. I have to give them credit. So this was, you know, you cannot do systematic reviews by yourself. You can, it'll take you forever. <laughs> it's always good to have a team. So if you see again, you know, so I highlighted learner characteristics and engagement. So those were the two themes. So you can see three out of four reviews found that to be most studied. Right. And then a least studied equity and accessibility, institutional administrative factors, management and organization. So a lot of the organizational ones were like least studied. So this shows, right, uh, even, you know, in this decade, similar topics were being studied. Again, you know, post COVID, it might be different. But this is how it was uh, at that point. Um, there were limitations. There's all these limitations, right? We lo looked at only 12 journals, only five search terms, and then coding process could have been biased. So you always want to be upfront about the limitations. Um, future research, you know, I've been advocating for more studies at the organizational level. Maybe there are pieces that are getting written that are not being published in these journals, or we def definitely need more studies at the organizational level. And then the sub themes of engagement and learner characteristics as ramification for teaching and learning professionals. And as I said, you know, we've gone in and now really looked at it, looked at the engagement themes a lot more closely post, um, you know, after we did this study. So it has a, a lot of benefit. And this is one of my last slides. And then we'll have a few minutes to, you know, chat and I'll take any questions. So um, as Dr. Bonk mentioned, you know, I, I asked him, I'm interested in writing a book. 
uh, and then he connected me with uh, the folks in Sage, um, actually also Rutledge. Uh, but then again, uh, you know, I went with Sage and here is my table of contents. Uh, just to give you an idea, what can you expect in a book uh, in a systematic review process, right? I just finished writing the first chapter, uh, Introduction to uh, Systematic Review. The second chapter, I'm going to talk about all types of methodologies to conduct systematic review but then zoom in on systematic reviews. Designing or framing a systematic review is important. And then including and excluding studies, that is a process in itself, right? What can you use in your systematic review and how do you set that a parameter? That's important, the process of searching and screening, then comes coding, and then you analyze and synthesize, and then you report findings. So that's kind of the process. I call it as the DISCAR process. D-I-S-C-A-R, designing, including searching, coding, analyzing, reporting, and then ethical considerations, you know, in, like in any research, you know, there's always ethical considerations to keep in mind. Um, I'm going to talk about that and then technologies that can support you in doing uh, systematic reviews. And then uh, one chapter I'm going to write on expert advice from researchers, from interviewing researchers. And then finally, just, you know, uh, wrapping it up and looking to the future. I'm excited about this book. Uh, it's going to be a long, long way, but uh, I'm excited. So here are a few references that I used. Um, in, in the uh, article, in the presentation, and that's my email. If any of you would like to contact me after today, uh, feel free to reach out if you need access to any of the art articles that I talked about. I'll be glad to uh, talk. So, Florence, I was going to ask if you were going to have a chapter or a section of a chapter on coding tools, because I anticipate my class would be very interested in the coding tools, given they're about ready to dissertate. Uh, and it looks like chapter 10 is going to have that. Is that right? Yeah. So I'm, put, I'm going to put all types of technology in one chapter. Um, I could have, you know, spread it out, but there's just every phase is technology these days, right? So yeah, for coding, I'm going to put, put, put them all together. Uh, and I saw that there was a jam board. Yeah, there's a jam board. Before we go to the jam board, I'll point out that, as you can see, Florence is a star and uh, her, her light is shining brightly. I'll also point out that if you normally talk to a statistics professor, hear a lecture from someone in inquiry or statistics, they'll have articles from 1977 and 1984 and 2001. And they'll be using those same articles for 30 years. And when they retire, that's all, that their little packet of articles will be the same ones. They'll all be torn to shreds because they use the same one for 30 years. Florence made an apology for having an article that was two years old. That, that's old. This is old to Florence as an article. But in the statistics world, old means something 50 years ago. So uh, no need to apologize at all. Uh, it's cutting edge stuff, as you could all tell that she was presenting on. I'll also point out that next week, John Hitchcock will present on mixed methods design, which Florence alluded to. Uh, he's a former professor of IST who works, works consulting as a consultant here in Bloomington. And we'll also have Merve Bazdegan, my former student, who will be also talking a bit about mixed methods and also how to do a literature review and how to form research questions and how to use survey tools and what the survey tools are. So we're going to extend what we had to today with, with uh, Florence with uh, next week. Um, and after Florence, and we take a break, um, after Florence, I'll come back and give you some more tips on writing and publishing my best tips. So be, now we can go to the Jamboard or to any question from anybody at any time. Um, Sunme, do we have a Jamboard questions? We actually have no questions on the Jamboard. Yeah. No. Okay, so who wants to jump in? Ben, Megan, Kim, Shannon, Yua, Aisha, go ahead. The floor you can is put it in chat too. Megan, go ahead. I was going to say I don't have a question. I just this is really helpful in terms of I was I was just on a research or I'm still on a research committee. Um, Ashat and I were helping out uh, Dr. Pawan too, um, and we were doing a, a, a systematic review. And it's just this is really helpful because it is a it's a great tool and it's a great you know thing to to do also for publication. So just yeah. thank you so much because it was really informative and I think your book's going to be amazing. So that's okay. great. Thank you. And so Megan, are you a Philadelphia Phillies fan today? Because they won by <laughs> one, one run. <laughs> yeah, I, I, 
I, the only thing I can't do is be an Eagles fan. Otherwise, I'll take all the other Phillies. <laughs> being, a, being a Giants fan my whole life, I can't convert to the Eagles. But everything else, I'll take Philly. But <laughs> Kim, are you a Giants fan too? Oh, no, no, no. We're Pittsburgh Steelers fans in my house. My husband's from Pittsburgh, but my family is from New England, Massachusetts. So they're Patriots fans. Oh, okay. <laughs> Kim, you got a question or comment for Florence? So um, I guess I have a comment or a question for Florence. Um, Florence, what do you think, um, as you kind of for, for, okay, let me put it, preface it this way. I'm not my, obviously you read my bio little thing. And if you can remember, I'm the associate professor mm -hmm. in animal science. And so I'm, I'm an academic who is not in instructional design or in learning sciences. So, um, with moving my career forward, um, what do you think would, for those people who are not necessarily their bread and butter, of what they do is not in um, instructional design and learning sciences as an academic. What do you think we should do? Um, and, and I guess, how do you think that we should move forward with our own research? I, do you understand what I'm getting at? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, even though you know, you're not in instructional design as, like as a professional, but you're still doing instructional design for your own courses right? So you are still applying that to uh, your own practice. So one thing you could do is um, if this will help you, you know, the way I started doing research is I always like my research to inform my teaching. That's how I kind of got into online learning too, because, you know, I used to do synchronously online and I spent several years studying synchronous online learning. And then I would take my findings and apply it to my classes not necessarily systematic reviews. I did survey based, I did interviews, you know, what are good practices? What are best practices and strategies? So it could be in animal science teaching context. Uh, so what works for this audience? I'm sure your audience is very different. Uh, your delivery methods might be different. Like right now, maybe you're doing blended or right. You might, I don't know if you have labs. So studying that I think might still be helpful. Uh, if you think that will make you a better instructor. And there might be a reason why you decided to pursue a doctoral degree in education or in, you know, in instructional technology, right? And not go just the content route. So yeah. let, let, me, let me point out that, that Florence studied award-winning online instructors. So there's organizations that provide awards. What was the organization that you looked at, Florence? Was it ACT? So I have done a couple of studies. Uh, the first round we did uh, organization. So we studied um, uh, USDLA, ACT, and OLC. So USDLA is United States Distance Learning Association, Association for Educational Communications and Technology, and OLC is Online Learning Consortium. So, and then the second round we did, uh, Kurt, if you haven't seen that article, I pub we published on Bicronis Online Learning, where we also interviewed award-winning online instructors, but we used instructors who had won online awards for online teaching at their institutions. And so you could do that. I mean, any of you could think about, I can't get a sample. I can't, this is, the, this is just way, there's someone, it's a natural study. It just, it's a kind of a no brain where people aren't thinking about it. If people have these awards. Well, how do they get these awards? What are the characteristics I, that, you know, make them? We, I've also had a former student look at the top 10 MOOCs uh, that were the most popular, the most, um, you know, high, highest uh, take enrollments. And he, what he did is he looked at the comments in the, in the reviews of that MOOC. It did it had machine, machine learning, look for keywords like on engagement and all this. And he came up with the top 10 things that these instructors do to make their course, you know, uh, really popular and engaging and so forth. It was just waiting to happen. No one had thought about, well, why don't you just take, look at the best ones, you know? And, uh, and I'm sure there's something like that in your respective fields. Um, so Megan might have a follow-up question since she put her video back, no? Okay. So uh, we'll, we'll throw, throw it to Ben, because on my screen, he's next to Megan. So go ahead, Ben. 
Oh, yes, this was a very helpful. Uh, sorry for not participating. I was driving. Uh, I was listening, but driving. <laughs> We're glad you didn't participate. <laughs> yeah. you know, much, you know, yeah. uh, one thing at a time. Uh, <laughs> I do want to point out, um, I had actually read one of your articles before knowing you were coming tonight uh, for my committee question. So I don't, I don't know if that gives me any kind of points. In the oh, world. yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. two bonus points right there. <laughs> oh, <I'm>, the <laughs> that's a fun connection. Um, <laughs> uh, definitely, I'm interested in seeing the big picture as well, as you mentioned. Um, besides just using the phrase uh, systematic review, uh, do you have any tips on finding systematic reviews? Is there a particular, well, and, and your website as well, but any other? Uh, to read, uh, like, uh, um, you're looking on a particular topic or broadly in educational technology? What do you uh, think? Probably uh, broadly. I'd, I'd probably be interested in any systematic review okay. with so education technology. I would recommend checking out two journals. So one is a review of educational research. You know, they publish only systematic reviews. Uh, I mean, they have some other secondary research too, but mostly systematic reviews and a meta-analysis and also educational research review. So those two are like big review journals. I actually did an analysis of last three year articles that they had published to see what methodology was used. And it was systematic reviews and metas. So, so Educational yeah. Research Review is Europe, Europe and RER is USA. They're kind of similar run by AERA runs the, runs the US one, RER. And so if you become an AERA member, you can select and get that journal. You can have one free journal with membership. And plus you get the Educational Research, which is a monthly kind of shorter articles and so forth. So I recommend at, for a student price to be a member of AERA is very cheap. And at least you know you should do it once during your lifetime, and the best time to do it is to, while you're dissertating. So I, I, I've, you know, because I became a fellow last year, I have to promote AERA, okay? <laughs> uh, and so I've been a member for a really long time, okay? Yeah. So a, so early is the European equivalent, it's the European Association for Research on Learning and Instruction. I used to be a member of that, and and educational what was it? Um, Education Research, Research Review. Research Review, yeah. Yeah, and Florence is on the board of that one, I guess, I'm right? I'm an Florence? associate editor. Yeah, even better. I'm the North American editor for that. You're the North. You're the North American contact for that journal. Yeah, I replaced Dan Hickey. You did. I okay. Did. Dan Hickey's in our learning science program. You might have taken a course. Dan, with him. And Dan recommended me. So really? Small yeah, so, world. Yeah, so those journals are nice because you'll see a lot of topics, but they are all review topics. And then you should also have access to those journals through your library. Yeah. So even if you don't get membership, you know, you yeah. should have access. So that's a good place to go to. AERA has a SIG on meta-analysis. If you're interested in meta-analysis, sometimes uh, you see SIGs like that. They have a SIG on systematic reviews of the research and right. meta-analysis. And meta-analysis, right. Meta right. Yeah. So, uh, but sometimes they are, they are a little too methodology focused. Uh, you know, then on the content, but uh, I always but, enjoy learning from them. So that's but it's a cool. it's a new division or a new SIG. SIG, I don't know how long the, they've the, been around. Yeah, yeah, I wrote to them because um, we had the papers on systematic reviews. I, you know, if you join AERA, you might think of joining that SIG, and they yeah. have they have SIGs $5. on on, five dollars. Yeah, and they have SIGs on online learning. They have SIGs on. Every, AERA has SIGs on every topic imaginable, forgiveness, you know, uh, you know, anything you can come up with, there'll be a SIG on it. But there's a lot of technology ones. Instructional technology is the big one for our field, the big SIG you probably should join. But there's also one called online learning and te teaching and learning, which I helped start way back when, when it's called the web, <laughs> worldwide web SIG or something like that. Um, but there are others, there's advanced learning technologies, which is more learning science oriented. Um, so you can, you what are some of the other technology ones, Florence, for AERA? Yeah, there's two, at least a couple more. There's one called Design and Technology, and then right. there's one called Tackle, which is more K-12 focused. Right. Yeah. 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 And there's Division C, the larger division. Yeah, division, and then they have sections. There's one called Learning. Section 3A is Learning Environments. 3B is right. Technology for Learning Environments. Right. There's so much of overlap. So if, if you join, get Division C, you get one division. And then you can, and then joining SIGs costs a little extra, and then you can choose which ones you want to join. Yeah. But great. I'm glad you let us on this conversation, Ben. Yeah. Uh, thank you. And uh, could you say the acronym real slow for me? I'm sorry. It, it's uh, 
E R E A? Is that? Oh, early. Uh, e A R L I, European Association for Research on Learning and Instruction. And there's a, they have a biannual conference in great cities in Europe. I've gone twice, maybe three times. And I've always, uh, you know, it's a very enjoyable one to go to Europe in the summer, you know, <laughs> in, in August. I think it's late August. It's August yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's early and. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Very, it's, it's smaller than ARA. ARA is 15,000 people. So early is a much smaller equivalent for the European. Some Americans go too. And I, I think it's, you create more community in the smaller ones, you know, definitely. Um, you could, you could propose your dissertation research too early. That would be, that's what I would recommend, you know, uh, take a stab at a conference that you might not have otherwise gone to. And since it's, the, it's going to be your pinnacle work of your life, unless you continue in this vein and do other follow-ups, some of you are only going to, you know, do this study and then you want to go back to your regular jobs and day, you know, and so forth. But, it, you know, you should try and have, go to a conference based on your dissertations, go to more than one conference. You should take segments and have one for AERA, one for ACT and one for a European conference. <laughs> hit, hit them all. <laughs> you know. uh, Yua, you had a question. Okay. I, I'm really impressed by all the work you do. Actually, I also read a lot of article from you as well, because I was, um, when I finalized my um, research focus for my dissertation, it's studying the competency required for instructional designer in higher ed. You published so many on that with, um, with a lot of research. So I read a lot of your articles actually. And I'm curious about question. Uh, first is the systematic review. Is, is it like similar, like, literature review, right? But more take a systematic approach to conduct a very thorough literature review for a topic. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, that's the difference. You know, in literature review, you're still doing searches, but then it's, you're probably not finding all that you can, right? Depending on the keywords you use and where you are searching. So you, you probably go with a certain perspective and you write it um, for a literature review, but a systematic review, just like the title says, it's systematic. Yeah. And I'm, I'm glad you are uh, studying competencies. I think that's another important area. Uh, oh, thank you. A lot more work. So another question regarding systematic review, how long does it take for you to conduct a systematic review? So again, it depends on the topic and how much is written on the topic. Uh, you know, if it's a fairly new topic, um, is it even appropriate to do a systematic review? That question comes up, you know, if it's something like brand new and like, for example, you know, I came up with this term called bikeriness, right? Uh, is there enough already? Maybe not. Um, so sometimes we see researchers trying to study like one year, two years of work. My perspective is you need to have a wealth of research already done. Um, but then again, how broad or narrow you are going to, if you're going too broad, then you'll have a lot more articles to do. So all that plays into time that takes. Uh, always recommend having a team you know, a one person team can take much longer and how much time you're willing to put in. Uh, so uh, all the ones I have done, minimum at least six months. I it's see. taken at least six months. So tell them what bichronous means. Uh, bichronous is the blending of asynchronous and synchronous online learning. Okay. You know, we always tend to think of online learning as either asynchronous or synchronous, and we try to compare them. And, you know, I'm making a case for blending them. We need both just not one or the other, so. That, yeah, I, actually, this is the first time I heard that. Um, <laughs> Thanks I'll for clarifying. That, I'll put no, that in the chat that. for you. You can, uh, I'll, that article just came out. I wrote, we wrote a, a uh, Educos piece on that two years ago. Uh, some people complain, do we need another term? Uh, I'll put both in there. Yeah. So when you send the, me the PDF of the uh, other article from the I'll educational the, psychologist, I'll then send you send me the, right the right, internet uh, and higher ed piece too. Right. This came yeah. out in internet and higher ed. 
which is a top journal again, yeah, um, which job. which finesses the, then in the other of our trio, she's the editor of that journal. So um, yeah, it's fun working with Florence and Vanessa. They know from reading, being the editors of different journals, they know what's good quality. Um, we haven't gone to Shannon. Shannon, or, or do you have a follow up, Yua? Or I do. If yeah, I go have... ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. It's more of my research question, um, my dissertation topic. So I'm studying the competency required for ID in higher ed, right? So right now I'm looking at the lens for instructional designer. I know you, in your paper, you conduct interviews, um, you know, with, or you did a systematic review. I think it was in 2019, the article you published. Yeah, um, we also did one recently. Did you see that? Um, uh, it came out in Journal of Computing and Education. You might like that one. Okay. I will look for that one. And what was your question, though? Was that a oh, so so the another angle I'm looking at is from the faculty's perspective. What do they think it's necessary for? You know, how do they collaborate with instructional designers? So that's another angle I'm looking at. Mm -hmm. um, so right now I'm thinking about like developing, you know, based on the instructional designer competency, I'm thinking about developing some like questions for faculty member. I don't know whether this is um like approach. Well, I think that's an important topic too, right? How IDs work with faculty. So there is a systematic review on that. Um, Saul Carliner and his student uh, did that one. I remember seeing that and that's a good one. Um, Saul was my guest last semester. He was, yeah. In, in, Saul yeah. and I served on the IPSTP board together. So that's a, definitely a good one. And here, I'm putting this one. This is the one I was wondering if you had seen. Uh, so in this, we looked at, we looked a little bit more broadly, um, just not IDs, because, you know, anybody in a learning and development position, roles and competencies. Um, so, Carliner. Okay. Saul's at Concordia University in Montreal. Oh, yeah. He's a... He's a big name in the corporate training side, but he does general stuff as well. He extends yeah. into, he can cover many things. Um, just more technical writing programs like that. He's from the US or A originally, maybe Pittsburgh area or something, or Ohio. If I can find his article, I'll put it. Oh yeah, I found it. Let me put that for you. You, you might benefit. I enjoyed this one. It came out in the PIQ, Performance uh, Improvement Quarterly. So Aisha and Shannon haven't asked a question yet, and someone else might have a follow-up, and Sumi hasn't asked. So um, Shannon? Well, I don't really have a question per se. Um, I'm listening to everything, and I'm kind of, um, so my dissertation is looking at the relationship between instructional designers and um, medical education faculty as well but instead of from the perspective of asking the faculty questions i'm actually targeting the instructional designers that work in medical schools faculty, yeah um so that's why i was very interested in, well i want to see this Saul thing all right um, so I, that's, I just put it in there yeah you might you yep. might enjoy that it's a relationship between ids and faculty in the design of online courses and higher ed all righty so yes i don't really have any questions per se um well, to be okay. honest, I am not a, I don't want I'm, I'm the weird odd duck out. I don't want to be a faculty when I grow up. I don't want to do research when I grow up. I really did this degree because I really just wanted to learn more. I love being an instructional designer. I want to be a builder. That's what I love doing. And you will be using research, right? You may not do research, but you'll yes, but not like real research. You know, I, I don't really care about writing papers and that sort of thing because I won't. I don't need it for my life. Um, and the only reason, you know, I wanted when I wanted to do this program just to learn more about being an instructional designer. I was going. I was perfectly happy going ABD, uh, but my wife said no. Mm. So. <laughs> You're almost there. <laughs> yes, exactly. Okay. Um, so yeah, so I'm just, you know, I just sit here and listen and try to absorb it all because I am not a researcher. And so I just need to listen and learn from everyone. Uh, Kim and I were in a class last semester. Uh, remember that class, with Dr. Prawan? I was on the struggle bus, man. <laughs> I was consistently and constantly lost in that class. It was on a uh, research theory and stuff like that, theoretical frameworks. I 
just lost. So it's a good Bill Murray film to watch. And that's the one where he says, take baby steps, baby steps. And really this class is really one little iterative part step after another. We're all taking little mm -hmm. chunks. I'm going to finish the gradient part three tonight. I got halfway through everybody's. Um, so it's just baby steps, baby steps along the way. And, you know, we don't want to freak people out. If you continue to take those steps, you can put it all together at the end of the semester and, and have something substantive that you can work from. You won't be complete, uh, but it'll be close, you know, to something that you can you can take home. Um, but, you know, if we put the something, you know, we had the meet, big meeting today in the department about that, you know, whether it should be a completed document or not. And I, I recommend no. <laughs> and uh, just doing quals is enough of a stressor in one semester, uh, you know, to do. Um, so thanks, Shannon, coming to my, us from my favorite city uh, in Wisconsin, where I was raised. She's in Milwaukee. Um, so and she works for IU Medical School. Uh, and so we should go on to um, Sunmei or Aishat. Um, Aishat's the star today because she's got publication. So I'll have her go last. Sunmei, you have a comment or a question? So actually, I learned a lot. So there is no specific questions, but just to actually, I really like to systematic, you know, review that actually before I try, but you know, actually I didn't have the time, so I didn't finish, but that's a really great way to learn more about the topic that I really want to work on the dissertation. So actually before I did, so, and then even if I didn't publish, you know, submit the, you know, paper, but it was really helpful for me. And then actually I have one question, but that is not related to the systematic review. So is that okay? Just, you know, I saw the your research outfit at, at that time, just in higher education, there are, you know, actually mostly a lot of the people work on the higher ed and then compared to K to 12, what is that? region you know what do you think about the region why so many oh people... the comparing the settings yeah yeah settings. that that was really interesting so yeah i don't know if there was a strong rational you know mm. for online learning you think mm. like you know we know that there is research that shows that online learning was better for older learners right uh, it's a little more harder for younger learners, but then COVID pushed everybody right. to go online. Yeah. Even though there are a few virtual academies mm -hmm. and virtual schools where we see probably middle school and above, you know, mm -hmm. you want them to be a little bit more self-disciplined before they go into an online setting. If, if they're in elementary school, it's really hard, right? They need right. that support. Exactly. Right. So just, but there are still important topics in different settings that still mm -hmm. needs to be studied. And there are researchers who dedicatedly study K-12 online learning. So it's always interesting to see is a particular theme studied to the same extent in different settings. Right. So, Thank you. Yeah, yeah that's, that's why. Very fun. Yeah. And then I think that maybe after COVID-19, maybe more people are working on K-12 as well. That's because right. anyway, right. all people you know work online still you know they are working right yeah, a little amazing. bit like, you know i right. sit on the advisory council for north carolina virtual public schools mm -hmm. which is the second largest in the nation after oh. florida's uh virtual schools and it's just the initiatives so you know there's so mm. much of teacher shortage in a lot of places and lots of reasons why they rely on a virtual school these days Mm -hmm. uh, specific subject they don't have a person to teach or like co-teaching options or mm -hmm. so I hear so many things going on there's a lot of reasons why you know kids end up going to a virtual school yeah. exciting so, so I can answer <laughs> both you. questions why did North Carolina become number two number one in the country is my friend Julie Young created the Florida virtual school and uh, became well known for that back almost 30 years ago. She was an early, they were an early adopter in Florida. But in North Carolina, they had a lieutenant governor who embraced online learning. And, and within one year, they went from nobody online to 25,000. Within two years, they went to 50,000. That's just because of the right person at the right place at the right time. And it happens sometimes. In terms of why do we study higher ed and not K-12 online learning? Well, higher ed embraced it much more quickly than K-12 had embraced it. K-12 was slow to jump into online teaching and learning. It happened in pockets in Hawaii, in Idaho, in Michigan, Indiana and Ohio were 
they'd start it and then they'd stop it. There were all sorts of problems. But North Carolina and Florida were the big states. Maybe Maryland might have been too. Those were the big states doing online in K-12 settings. In higher ed settings, New York, state of New York, big time uh, was happening. Indiana big has been a leader in terms of this. Uh, and there are many states um, who have been experimenting, state of Washington, um, because of Bill Gates and those money there, and Arizona, because of Arizona State. So there's, there's reasons for it. It's just that, and people are, who is going to research it? There are K-12 teachers aren't going to be doing research. So higher ed was leading the way. There are researchers going to study their own environments. They're studying what was taking place at their on their campus, and then hence all this research was happening in higher education settings. It was funded by the, the university would move to online. They wanted, they funded it. You know, they gave little seed money for pockets of money to study why it was happening. So they built up over time. And with 4,000 universities and colleges in this country, it would, you know, over this last, it's been going on for 25 years, 30, almost 30 now, there's a lot of studies in higher ed. That's as a result. And so, uh, the corporates also embraced it, but the corporates didn't fund studies of it. They embraced it for other reasons. Um, so we should go to a shot because if we need to give Florence a break, we, she's gone longer than we, we expected. But a shot, could you please give us the 20 second elevator pitch on your article? And, and if it's OK, I will share this with the class on drone technology. So a shot, can you tell us what's in this article and then ask your question? Well, oh, that. Um, I took a production class a few years ago, and I had the opportunity to start what we call a drone club at my school. So I wanted to look at it from the perspective of an instructional designer. Why? What is this for? Apart from kids coming into my classroom, eating my snacks, and playing with drones, what exactly can you achieve? So that's why I looked at it from purpose. So I designed the course using Meru's first principles. And I was able to get two people to, and with people to evaluate it, they had questions. So based on the evaluation, we made an update and all that. And so a paper kind of came out from that. If I remember Ben Stevens, I did present this at um, the last IST conference. I think Ben, you were there. Correct me if I was wrong. No, I know. I remember one of my classmates. I assume it was Ben, but yeah. Was it online? Was it the yeah? Uh, it was yeah. online. Yeah. I that presentation. So, yep. Yeah. So from that, I just said, okay, I just kept pushing. So in between completing grades in May and doing this, I just turned it in just in case. I proposed was at least get one article rejected before I graduate. Lo and behold, it was accepted. So. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't, I'm in Bloomington. I didn't see the drones flying overhead. So were you no, doing drone, drones over at Bloomington North outside? Yeah, or? Bloomington North. There's a limit, right? You shouldn't fly within 4.5 miles. From uh, so my school is specifically for exactly 4.5 miles. And uh, they actually have drones at IU. I know ge the geology, they have like over $150,000 worth of drones. That drone is pretty cool. So yeah. Yeah. So what do you have for question for Florence as the final question for tonight? You're the star today. Congratulations <laughs> star. again. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Florence, I just wanted to say that's your paper, the one you presented here. We read it, so we're going to do, we did, I did um, write another paper, systematic review, we follow every instruction you had on this paper from step. So I've actually used this method. All I can say is thank you very much for it. If you follow the paper, I would have put the step by step, you will not go wrong. That's all I can tell people. So you broke it down to the simplest form. So what could have been very, very taxing became at least a little bit more to understand. And yeah, it was rejected though. Thank you for your apologies, Dr. Bunk. But <laughs> at least we went somewhere. Glad so it was helpful. Yeah, rejections are part of publication process. You should just not give up. Right, make the changes and send it elsewhere. Yeah. So that's we get why. Rejected too. You know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> after all these years, we still get rejected. So. <laughs> and that's why Florence is doing the book because she can write in, in language that people can understand step by step. And, and, and she'll give us the announcement of the book. When it comes out, I will share it with this class. Um, so I want to give Florence a round of applause and thank her for staying a little extra. And and I and, and for everyone here, uh, uh, could you do one more favor for me besides sending me any calls? Send on, on if you took calls, send them on, on an email. The second thing I would like you to do is say to 
Four words with me in unison. I'll count to three. Please come back, Florence, for next semester with my next class. So on the count of three, please come back, Florence. One, two, three. Please, please come, come back, back Florence. Florence. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be glad. I'll be glad. It's probably be the last time I teach this course for a while. Not sure, but I'm going to do it uh, in I the might, spring. I might have to present on one of the newer um, articles. Anything's new that you've produced in my mind, but I'd love to get the freshest and newest pieces. It's been a delight having you with us tonight. Um, I'm all my students, and, and I, there are two that couldn't be with. I'll share it in. Uh, I'll create a YouTube video. I'll share it with you. I'll share it with them. I'll put it in Canvas tonight as well. Um, later tonight, when it converts, it culture has to convert it all. But um, so part one is going to stop the recording again. Thanks again. You are Thank great. You. All of you have a wonderful semester, and I will see you all later. Okay, bye. Thank Good you. Night. Bye.